Welcome very much to our fourth virtual event for the museum. Um, so we hope everybody had an opportunity to watch the documentary. If you didn't get the link or you had trouble, just let us know and we can resend the link for you. It should be viewable for another week from what, from what I understand. Yes. Um, so that you if, you, if you didn't get a chance to see it beforehand, it should be available for the next week also. Um, oh, I can, I can introduce myself. I'm Karen Albert. I'm the acting director and chief curator at the museum. And the program tonight is really um, going to be, be handled by Kristen Rudy, who's our uh, associate curator and collections manager at the museum. And she curated an exhibition entitled Nevertheless, She Persisted, which is an exhibition of women artists from our permanent collection, which was uh, scheduled to open in March and, of course, did not. So, um, but we had already scheduled programming associated with the exhibition and we wanted to um, try to continue to do that. So we, we did a virtual reception and we, uh, most of the information is on our website for the exhibition with Interdictive Momentum. And our other uh, contributor tonight is Susan Schaefer, who's an adjunct faculty member um, of art, uh, excuse me, art history faculty member at Hofstra. Hello. Uh, Kristen, if you want to uh, go ahead and sure. get started. Okay. Um, so welcome everybody to sort of reiterate Karen's welcome. Um, this was um, an event that we had planned from the beginning of planning for this exhibition when we thought we would have a physical exhibition. Um, and I um, reached out to our uh, colleague, uh, Sarah McCluskey at the Media uh, Film Library at Hofstra, and I, I have to thank her as well because she was really integral in getting um, the rights to this movie that we originally were going to show in the Guthart Theater today. Um, and then when we had to make it virtual, she again was really helpful to getting the rights available to do um, this in a virtual way. Um, but so here we are, uh, the Women Art Revolution, uh, this film, um, again, just to show that our, the hosts here are Karen, myself, uh, and Susan, who is so, uh, had graciously agreed to help us out again when we were going to do it in the Guthart Theater, and, uh, and once again, when we changed to being virtual, she again said, no problem, um, and so we're really happy to have her here as well to talk sort of about this film that, um, Hopefully you're all were able to see. Um, just some, I know we're probably now all uh, very proficient in Zoom now because we've all been doing this for weeks, but if not, um, some Zoom tips. Uh, generally we say it's better to start with it on mute. Um, if you have, uh, I kind of want to keep this a very casual and very open dialogue, so do feel free to hop on the chat. If we have, I think we're up to about 15 or 20 participants. So um, that's probably the easiest way to sort of start talking um, and, you know, figure out what viewing platform looks best for you. Um, so I also wanted to mention again, Karen mentioned it in her sort of intro, that uh, this program was supposed to be in conjunction with the exhibition that I curated, Nevertheless, She Persisted. Um, which was going on view the end of March and features works of art by women in our collection. And um, if you do go to our website, um, you can kind of explore the exhibition um, virtually. Um, all the works are up there with um, the label copy, uh, labels that would have uh, accompanied them in the gallery. Um, and eventually it will go up, so we'll let you know whenever we can physically install it. Um, but what I thought was interesting about uh, was this sharing this movie was that it kind of brings in another aspect. Um, the exhibition isn't specifically about the feminist art movement. It's not about um, these crucial people and key events that were happening in the 60s, 70s, 80s. Um, although there are aspects, you know, obviously in there. So I thought it was interesting in this film to sort of um, dig into another aspect of 
um, the exhibition that maybe I wasn't able to go completely into. Um, so I just kind of wanted to open up the program with some general ideas, general thoughts, what people thought was successful, what people thought was most interesting. Um, I don't know if anybody has anything off the bat. I, I posed some questions here about general sort of ideas. How does, um, how do you feel that the director, Lynn Hirschman Leeson, contextualized the feminist art movement? Um, what was most surprising to you in the, in the film? And um, did you feel like there were any aspects that felt left out or not discussed fully? Um, I, uh, yeah, Susan, if you want to. You can jump in. Um, I noticed that someone's dog had an opinion in the background. Did you hear the dog? That's my dog. I'm sorry. <laughs> I love your dog. I'm glad. I love a dog that has an opinion. Yeah, he is um, upset because he oh. can't come here. <laughs> I know uh, one of my dogs interrupted one of my Zoom classes yesterday by like jumping on my lap and like, yeah. me, and it was great. And the students loved it. So, you He's know, at me. so he may make an appearance himself. <laughs> he doesn't like feminist art so much. No, well, you know, it's, you know, there's <laughs> some of it that uh, maybe is a little more challenging for, exactly. for, for, for the audience. But, you know, I just wanted to say, I think she um, undertook something that she understood was going to be insurmountable task, right? Because she really sets this up as a personal narrative, right? It's her own story. It's, and, and sort of early on recognizing that something very important was happening in this movement and this desire to document it. So of course she has so much document, right? There's so much video. And I love the fact that she makes that available because it's great to use in, in coursework and um, these, these huge interviews that she undertakes for you know, 30, 40 years, essentially, but actually even longer. But you know, so it's that was a challenge, I think, for her to sort of try and contextualize it, really. Yeah. Um, so as a, as a narrative, I feel like sometimes she doesn't give us enough context. Right. And sometimes you want, like, it, 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 from my position, you know, having, you know, studied this, uh, you know, I'm actually an architectural historian by trade, but I do teach, you know, feminist art, I teach contemporary art also at Hofstra. So I know a bit about it. And, um, you know, I found that in some places, if I didn't have my background, I wouldn't necessarily know what she was you know, what, what she was actually driving at or what she was referring to or what the interviewees were referring to. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think that um, she's, you know, when she, and at the end when she talks about, you know, opening up the dialogue, making this something that's, um, that's you know, document rather than, than, you know, a complete, you know, view into it. It's just um, trying to get her document out um, in a way that's accessible or in, it, that she can introduce it to the, to the general public. And I think in that way it was, it's successful. Yes. Yeah. Um, I thought it was interesting. I mean, obviously as her, her being an artist and being a part of this movement and including her own work, I thought it was interesting. And I thought it was, I thought it was also smart that she, you know, was very open about the idea that she was including her work and, and why she decided yep. to include her work in the movie, in the film. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, um, I also thought it was interesting um, as somebody who did not like, wasn't living during that time that there was like this, really this kind of feeling of revolution from, you know, all of this up kind of upheaval and, up, and unrest, you know, you had Vietnam, you had, uh, you had Kent State, you had Yes, um, you know, yeah. things are happening. Um, and then you have the Whitney protest and, you know, sort of kind of putting those sort of sort of feminist movement in that kind of uh, moment was very, um, you know, interesting and very, you know, makes more sense. <laughs> Right. And, you know, and she does talk a little bit about the, the tensions between like minimalism, right? Yes, At the time right. it was dominated by like white men, right? right? The whole yeah. idea behind minimalism. And I, I guess I, 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 I wished for more context here for like the general 
public to understand what minimalism is and the idea that it's this you know, sort of abject, impersonal, like when I teach it, I tell my students, you know, minimalism just isn't that into you, right? It doesn't <laughs> care if you like it, you know, it just is yeah. there. And, um, and so that, that notion that um, understanding art that lacks expression, right? And also the idea that, um, you know, that had emerged in reaction to a response to abstract expressionism, right? Again, right. white men, mm -hmm. right? Dominating that, that movement too. So you have, you know, the two foremost um, movements happening, particularly in, in, in New York, um, being dominated by white men. One is expression, the expression of the man, the, exp the male individual, yeah. right? And the other one, this abject, impersonal, yeah. you know, work that rejects you. And then you have the, the women are emerging within this context of like, they want to have a voice, they want to have an expression. Um, and so they're, you know, they are responding really. To, and, and the critics too, you know, you have Clement Greenberg, who who's like um, promoting all the abexers at this time. And so they're, they're responding to this like very closed system of power um, that, that doesn't have diversity, that doesn't, doesn't listen to a woman's voice. And so that, I think that context is really uh, important too within the art mm -hmm. world and sort of understanding what they, were, what they were railing against. It wasn't just the external politics, it was the internal politics within the system of power in the art world right. itself. Right. Um, yeah. Um, but so I also liked that she interviewed some of the artists at different, the time frame of it, mm -hmm. that some were kind of early on in the movement and some were when they were in their 70s and 80s. And that was kind of an interesting juxtaposition. I felt that you saw them could, to, in the moment, to be capturing what they're, you know, videotaping what their response is early on and then talking to them again later. I found that very interesting. I did right. too. Yeah, yeah. I would have liked more of that too. But you know, yeah. again, how much, I mean, I'm sure she's got all that footage. It's just, but yeah, I didn't that time. Too. Yeah, sure. Yeah, that they were able, able to sort of look back on their own career and, and, and on what they learned from or, or um, yeah. yeah. It looks like we have a comment here. Comment. Um, they say that it's interesting that some artists today are heading back to where we were when this started. So, um, well, I don't know. Um, I, I agree. I mean, they're talking about the new generation, right? The mm -hmm. up and coming generation. And they're, and they're sort of, I, I think, I can't remember who it was. It was uh, at the, near, near the end who was interviewed who said, you know, she didn't realize that she was doing some oh, yeah. of the things that were happening in, yeah. the, yeah. in the early yeah. parts yeah. of the movie, yeah. the performance yeah. art. And so this idea that, um, the, the, you know, there's a dialogue, but also the conversation in some ways remains uh, consistent. Right. Yeah. And I think part of the reason that she didn't know it had existed was because it was in the history books. Right. So, I mean, to not under, to know that these artists were doing this in the 70s and 80s and, not, and, and it wasn't really recorded, you know, yeah. it wasn't taught, it wasn't in the galleries, it wasn't in the right. You and know, so in was, that way, it is so, a conversation that still has to happen, right? right. Because it still right. isn't. So it hasn't been kind of in the context of, of, our, hist of our history or, you know, in this, you know, in this kind of realm. So, um, yeah. Or I also thought it was interesting when Judith Baca was talking about later, when she was talking about her students, like, I think this was like in the early 2000s or like 2010 or something, her students feeling this like rejection of feminism or this return to mm -hmm. sort of the 1950s sort of sentiment of feminism right. and I I you know I can kind of remember learning about feminism in in school in undergrad and being sort of like you know learning about Judy Chicago as sort of like this you know sort of outlier sort of um you know all this art that was so I forget who it was that said that they when they went into Woman House and then Judy Chicago screamed at her because it wasn't yeah right she <laughs> wasn't, wasn't like yeah but you're not being you know Wilson. that's Martha Wilson yeah yes yes yeah, yeah. <laughs> right and sort of like this <laughs> like oh my gosh so there's like um but I think it's so for me it was interesting to see this to see how you know you have to make these moves to be able to be um to get to the point where there's a like a rejection back at it you know 
Right. And the idea that they it's seen more as a limitation. I think that's what one of the right. artists heard it as seen it as a limitation. Like all of a sudden you become in this category and then right. that, that, that identifies you with Judy Chicago and with this earlier generation. Right. And you're not yeah. even able to create your own identity or your own right. path because then you become sort of typecast or stereotyped in that sense. Yeah. yeah. Um, I just felt like we were talking. So I just thought also, um, that it was interesting in this exhibition, in this, you know, something that I wasn't able to include in the exhibition, which was so critical to the feminist movement was, and was so critical in this documentary, is the, uh, is performance art and, and how the feminist movement really uh, embraced the um, feminist art, um, I mean, performance art, and, um, and sort of ideas of why it was maybe so critical and, and, um, it was able to to do things that other medias weren't. Lisa said something. Lisa. Oh, Lisa great. Teaching uh, performance art this fall. Excellent. Uh -huh. Great. And I've so I've included a, a photo here of the uh, they made reference to the Carolee Schneemann's um, up to and including her limits, but um, you know Marina Abramovich as well, and this idea of sort of. Um, using the female body and especially the nude female body um, as not just an object, but at, like as the, the, the content of the work, um, I think was critical, obviously. Um, but was there any, I, I'm just curious if people, sometimes performance art is kind of hard for people to swallow. <laughs> and if anybody felt, um, oh, we have an, okay, so we have a question from Connie Anderson that in her modern drama class that was it, was that if it is possible to identify a play was written by a woman or a man? I was wondering if that question also applies to other forms of art such as painting. It's a good question. I, I think people depends. think they can tell, but I don't think. Right. You know, it I, depends. depends. And I think that it if in our that. exhibit, and then nevertheless, she persisted. You can see there's every type of artwork, you know, uh, painting, sculpture, trend making, uh, all different styles from representational to completely abstract. Mm -hmm. I, I, don't, I don't think it really, and there are actually yeah. a number of women artists who don't want to be in shows that are just women artists. Right. So, because they don't want to be categorized just as a woman artist. And Karen, so right. yeah. sorry to interrupt you. Don't you have a Sonia yeah. Delaunay in your um, yeah, we do. show too? I mean, she's yes. a sort of example of someone who doesn't, you know, um, doesn't identify in sort of yeah. No, I, yeah. I, it was important to me when I was when I was selecting the works for this exhibition that I wasn't, um, you know, there's a diversity of media, there's a diversity of style, a diversity of um, backgrounds of the of the women so it's not just like monolithic like women's yeah. art right um yeah. but i think it is important to note that in in this film where you're kind of talking about the beginnings of feminist art and they're sort of trying to make a name for themselves there is a fairly fairly bold identification as a woman as being woman right you know um we talk about g chicago and the use of um uh, uh, vaginal shapes and uh and breasts and you know things that are um identified as women right and even especially in performance right because it's yes. like it's, well, it's impossible yeah. to just you know to not see gender or to see um yeah i think that's that's all i have to say i think someone has a comment here yes um we have a you said that Melanie Marsh um, says that she's an artist and I love performance art, but feel that women have a hard time with the public to understand the message when they get wrapped up in our bodies when nudity is used. Mm -hmm. And Catherine says female performance art is a way to empower women and give them agency over their bodies versus being just a model. So Very good to opposing a, qu a question and sort of an answer. That was great. <laughs> I mean, it is. It's the idea of the male gaze, right? I mean, we talk yeah. about this a lot in art history, right? So starting with when we're looking at the, the Venuses of, of, of Titian, you know, and um, how to subvert the male gaze and all of this sort of thing. And I think that that becomes really 
um, at the forefront of a lot of performance art, particularly um, when women are sort of embracing their own bodies and choosing how they wish to be presented, right? Rather than being the subject of the, uh, or sort of just the subject, they're also the creator. So it, it gives them agency over their own bodies. And I think that's what, you know, what distinguishes it from, from, uh, from the male gaze, right? Right. Yeah, I agree. And a lot of the performance art, of course, does include nudity, but there was, you, I mean, you can think of also like Lynn, like the director herself, Lynn Hirschman, she was mm -hmm. doing a performance for years of just creating this other person who um, had a psychiatrist and had a driver's license and had roommates or right. um, this other type of performance, right? So, And also um, Martha Rosler in the kitchen. Right, right. yes, yeah. exactly. Uh, you get obviously the the nudity kind of gets the most uh, attention sometimes because <laughs> the male gaze. Let's be exactly. honest. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> yeah, right. Um, yeah, and it's. I, I, I was also interested when I was watching this, though. I was also struck and was doing some follow up research. Um, you know, sort of the limitations of works like this are often. I mean the women who were doing this are young, they're white, and they're attractive most, you know, they are, they kind of, yeah, it was um, lack of, you know, something, there was a lack of diversity and a lack of, um, of, you know, who also, who is included in the feminist movement. It was, if there's so much emphasis put on the breast and the, uh, you know, the parts that perhaps somebody who identifies as a female who doesn't, have those parts would be left out. Um, That's true. Right? For lack of a better, <laughs> lack yes. of, you know. No, it's true. I mean, I'm glad you right. brought that up because I was thinking about this when I was watching this too. Like we got a little bit of Faith Ringgold, right? We talked yes. about her in context of, right. you know, the um, her protest in, in 1970 of the Whitney, which was huge, right? Yes, and yes. Her and like two other people, right? right? And it just gained momentum from that. And, you know, the painted eggs, you know, that she put in, which I love. Right. Um, but I wanted to hear, you know, I wanted to hear more from her, right? Because she right. was, you know, she was identifying both as an African-American woman as part of the um, Black Arts Movement, right? That was right. emergent in the, right. in, you know, out of Harlem. And then also as a woman. So, um you know, and she was really active in um, in promoting women's art and particularly mm -hmm. the art of minorities, uh, minority women. So I, I would have liked to, yeah, you know, I would like to have heard more from her, but I teach her a lot. So I, I you know, and I show a lot of video of her talking and she's just so powerful of a force um, yeah. in sort of mediating that that area. And, and she's also a different type of body, you know, she's a different type of presence and a different type of art, so. Yeah. And um, Lisa Merrill, who is joining us as well, she also just pointed out that as co-director of Women's Studies, she is also, like the point I made, interested in diversity and non-binary approaches, right? So there is this, um, again, this, I think it's important. I think this film is important. I think it's also important, like, that this is how it begins. And there was, thing, there were people left out, but um, they made great room for people later. Um, but it's important, I think, to note that there were, you know, people it's left out. It's a conversation, you know, our, yeah. our, our, our thoughts on, on you know, uh, non-binary. Um, right. What does it mean to be a woman? I mean, you know, thing. right. You know, and, and this is a conversation that comes up in my classes when we talk about um, Judy Chicago, right? And the, right. the, the emphasis on the vagina. The and vagina, right. right. You have to have a vagina to be a woman. And so this always ends up being a big conversation. And I'm like, guys, it's 1979. You know, right, like right. you have to realize you have that. To remember your con the context and right. sort of what the dialogue. Uh, was. I, that to me was the most one. Of the, I think one of the most surprising things was the the hour and a half on the co on Congress on the floor of Congress when they were discussing. Yep. Oh Chicago's yeah, yeah, dinner party. Yeah. For somebody who I grew up going to the Brooklyn Museum and seeing the dinner party and just thought it was cool and never really thought of it as, I mean, I mean, you know, obviously it's a little bit sh it's shocking, but it was you know it's not, it was just. It was in this institution. It was, you know, the fact right. that the government was was having this long conversation about um, whether it's art or pornography. pornography. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but this, you know, you have to remember this comes in the wake of the the piss Christ uh, right. uh, Serrano debate too yeah. about where he, um, you know, he he um, the NEA funding, right? right. And, right. And, and yeah. This whole idea of should. Uh, should um, government funding and the NEA actually fund things that they find um, um, 
pornographic or also offensive. And so it comes within that whole cultural wake of, you know, Reagan's, you know, administration and it's right yes. at the end of that. So, you know, just, uh, just throwing that out there for some context. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Right. But um, no, it was. I mean, it is shocking. There, you know, there's yeah. these white men, really. Against, right. And I think oh, what I think is also I interesting like China. Is, oh my God, is something that's like I, I, I had known about this Christ, and I had known about that being talked about in Congress, but I don't think I knew about Judy Chicago's, and I think that's even been like down. You know what I mean? It has it totally like, it, has just right? because she's a woman. They didn't tell me about that. They were like talk yeah. about Andre Serrano, but they're not going to tell me about. How no, no, and were you, were you Chicago is. And and when you were taught this, were you taught that the other women feminists reacted against it? Because that's what I learned. You know, right. yes. that's intro course. The other women were railing against it because of the genitalia, but you don't hear about like the larger the larger right. story. Yeah, I agree yeah. with that. That was interesting. Mm -hmm. Um I I also thought another thing that I was um I always found interesting and I sort of we um sort of Again, we kind of talked about this, but these are so these are the three works that are by artists who were talked about in the film and that are also included in the Nevertheless She Persisted exhibition. Um, and if we start, I'm going to start on the right with Gorilla Girls. I also was struck by throughout the movement how much humor is used mm -hmm. um, and how much um, humor can be used as a tool and as a weapon. Um, even Faith Ringgold, when she's when the, the the egg protest i mean that was ingenious but it was kind of funny too right you know um but okay. that it is very it's very approachable i think it yes kind of makes people easy to kind of understand it kind of without thinking they have to take it totally seriously seriously or yeah and arms that it's kind of an easy entry for people, I think. Yeah. Right, like that this, the beginning where you had to walk into Woman House and it was a little bit scary and in your face. And then in the 80s, you get the Gorilla Girls who are using humor in their posters in this graphic way, um, you know, to try to call you out and call out yeah. institutions yeah. and just make, re make you look, make viewers and institutions look foolish. Mm -hmm. Um, right, and I think that represents kind of the two different waves too, right? right. You know, that first generation, right? Chicago, she's very intense, right? Yes. She'll make you cry <laughs> if you criticize anything. Right, right. Yeah? Um, and then you have that second generation, like with Marsha Tucker, who does the um, the Bad Girls exhibition. They're talking yeah. about that and how right. she's using the sense of humor, but she also realized that sense of humor can sort of prick other levels too, right? When you use humor, it can um, it can also, you know. Uh, enrage people as well, but I do think there's a difference in their approach, right, between the two yes. different generations. Right. Yeah. Um, so that was. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> no, 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 that's fine. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, I like to show this um, little film clip on YouTube to my classes on the Gorilla Girls. And it's just a few years ago when they were doing, um, they were doing a, um, some work in Minneapolis where they're like doing a takeover the city in Minneapolis. Yeah. And they're on the, um, um, oh, I can't remember that. It's one of the night shows, right, where they're being interviewed by um, uh, the Tonight Show or something like this. And um, so they're still, it's still the same group of women. You can recognize mm -hmm. the glasses and you recognize their yep. features and gestures. And, and, you know, so they're still continuing that dialogue even, you know, very recently. Yeah, they are. And they're very, yeah, um, they're a great group and they still are around, like you said, and they're, now they are, they've also like kind of taken on, they call themselves what, the, um, the consciousness of the art world. So they're, they're, they still fight for, you know, representation and equality, but they're also, I think now also focusing on like, you know, um, looking into where the money is coming the from. Funding, the, yeah. The funding, yeah. you know. We should, funding, that sure. museums should be divesting from, um, you know, big dangerous pharmaceutical companies right, or right. whatever. Um, so, but yeah, they are still, still, you know. <laughs> yes, they still are out and they did a, um, they still do um, performances and speaking engagements. They were at Stony Brook in the last couple of years, because mm -hmm. I had seen them out there. But for me, I was in college when they started this, and just starting to study art history. And the Gorilla Girls had a big impact on me as a curator, because I always think about who I'm selecting for an exhibition, and where they're coming from, and what their perspective is. 
And that's totally because of them. Right. Because that wasn't really, nobody really talked about that. You know, that idea that the curator has this power of what they're presenting yep. um, by, by your selection. You're, you know, you are making choices all the time, but you really are, you know, whether somebody's really getting out there and being seen, it can make a big, big difference. So that, you know, makes me very conscious as a curator of what artists I'm choosing and why I'm choosing them and making sure that I'm trying to get a diversity and a, and a different kind of perspective. You're right, and, then that, and that that diversity isn't just gratuitous, right? I mean, that's no, no, that, that it has, yeah, that has a purpose. It has yeah, not, exactly. yeah, right. It's, it's yeah. that fine balance, like you want to include diversity, but you're still making the same sort of aesthetic choices. Right. Too. So, right. you know, I think about that a lot when I teach, especially contemporary art, because um, do I separate all the women and teach them together? Like, that's not right, right either. Right. So, right. Yes, certainly with the, you know, with the radical feminist movement in the 70s and, you know, you, you do because it's a, an, an actual, um, an actual movement. Right. And then, you know, you don't want, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a constant rethinking of the, you know, of, of what I present, how I present it. Um, and do you, do you incorporate it alongside the men and making sure I'm not choosing things just gratuitously? Yeah, right. it's, it's, it's constant updating that, that we have to do. And I think it's a, it's a good exercise to, yeah. to keep ourselves mindful of that when we're making choices for sure. Right. Yeah. Um, and I, um, we brought out, you spoke about Faith Ringgold earlier, but, um, we have this wonderful work by Howard Dina Pindell on the left who is uh, also featured in the, in the uh, film. Um, she's just a, a wonderful person. And, and I think she's an important person who didn't get, she could, I would like that, would have liked more from her in the film as well. Um, yeah. Yeah. Especially as, um, you know, she's one of the founding members of the AIR gallery. Um, and Howardina, I think, is also constantly like a, a pin in people's sides because she's constantly sort of, uh, She's probably not in the film that much because she was constantly, you know, calling for the diverse, diversifying the movement. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, she, you know, used to work at MoMA and had to leave because they, she was not happy there. And they, perhaps she was asked to leave. I'm not exactly sure. But mm -hmm. um, um, so she's an, she's an incredible, um, you know, artist and person. And, and, and thinker. Uh, she's brilliant, and, too. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah, whenever she, whenever she was in the, in the, and I hadn't, I didn't know that much about her before this, honestly. Mm -hmm. And every time she, she spoke in the, in, you know, in, in the film club, it made me want to, want her to speak more. So I agree that yeah. I would like to yeah. hear more from her, for sure. No, and I think she still is very activist as far as trying to make sure that people are heard. I mean, I think that's one of her big, big issues that she's always had. Um, she right. came and spoke at Hofstra about oh, probably 10 or 12 years ago. We had invited her to the museum. She came. Cool. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, and unfortunately, Kristen and I have said this before, this photograph of her work does not do it any yeah. justice at all. It's a three-dimensional work made of basically paper circles that have thread and, and are all bound together. This really doesn't show the work at the best, in its best way. Yeah. But, uh, it's hard to photograph without showing a bunch of photographs about it. Right, right, right. yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's beautiful. So she had given us this work from herself. So, yeah. Right, yeah. and she's um she's a professor out at um Stony, Stony Brook, yeah. so she's somewhat local. Yeah, yeah, and sort of also like a, you know distanced herself from the New York City thing, also. Yeah. Um, and then in the center we have Miriam Shapiro, who is sort of like one of these grand dames of the feminist movement and sort of, um, you know, I, it's real, I, to me, it was really interesting to see how everybody presented themselves in the film. Mm -hmm. And, and Miriam Shapiro has these big pearl earrings on and she's very put together and she's very, um, she's very, looks like her fan. She looks like, you know, a woman, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and uh, I think it's interesting that, you know, she and Judy Chicago were out at CalArts and it was like her husband was in CalArts and he invited them and they could start right. this little feminist program. Um, I think it was sort of hinted about a couple of times that there was these sort of, uh, you know, uh, tensions between 
Yeah, personality conflicts. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it makes 100%, if you look at Miriam Shapiro and you look at Judy Chicago, that they would probably have tension. <laughs> yeah. no, it's true. Right. You can yeah, tell those, I just couldn't get over those huge pearl earrings that she was wearing. <laughs> I really couldn't. <laughs> she was, she's fancy. She is. Yeah. <laughs> right. She is. But, you know, uh, still an important, you know, she's, sure. you know, doing great things for um, and Judy Chicago, I love, she still looks like she did when she, in 1980, you know, yes. 1982, right? <laughs> yes. I mean, it, even if I have pictures of her when, at the, in, um, when they opened the, the Brooklyn, when she, when she, uh, when they op the, did the opening uh, night for, you know, the installation of, of the, um, the dinner party. And she looks mm -hmm. exactly the same as when she was <laughs> photographed when they, when, when she first made it, she wears the same glasses. She's got the right. same the clothes on. She's fabulous. <laughs> um, yeah. So, um, and this is a work that we, um, it's from a, a portfolio, um, sort of like a technology using new technology in the early eighties, late seventies. Um, so it's sort of interesting that Miriam Shapiro was included in there and part of this um, work, work portfolio. Um, I, are there any other sort of big idea? I know it was like a lot to go over, but I mean, I sort of just kind of picked out things that I was sort of interested about and wanted to talk about, but if anybody else has sort of ideas or things they wanted to bring up, I'm happy to talk more. Well, I think um, it's interesting, even just with your examples here, to see, I mean, somebody had asked about, you know, whether you can tell an artist is a, you know, male or female by their work. I mean, some of the artists, like Miriam Shapiro, obviously took things that were traditionally women's right, work. Right, women's. <laughs> like the idea of the fan, the thing, right. or needlepoint, or things like that, that were traditionally women's work, and then went from there, where other artists didn't have any interest in doing that. So even within, you know, that group, there was a, a difference about how they approached that, fem that, you know, whether they were really feminist materials or basing on what women's work used to be, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. So. Oh, okay. If you did not, um, Peggy says she didn't get the link for the movie. Uh, we can make sure that you get that. I can, she, I can send it to you after. Yeah. Okay, Karen will send a few. It's also, I should also have mentioned, if you have Amazon Prime, it's also on Amazon Prime. Also, Karen, no to what you were saying about, you know, what Miriam Shapiro and, and, and you know, and quilting and needlework. Right, right. You know, that was sort of the, the driving force behind Judy Chicago's work as well. And, and right. having more collaborative, which like right. quilting is always mm -hmm. a, is a collaborative effort. It also has a long tradition in American history. And so doing needlework and stitchery and then pottery all of these things have been traditionally uh, considered sort of women's art right. um, and then putting them together in a large scale, um, you know, you know, at the, the dinner party and so this large scale installation is sort of right. highlighting women's craft, right. On a, as a, right. as a form of high art, as opposed to craft. And yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Elevated, yeah. Um, and I mean, talk about quilting. That's also Faith Ringgold right there. Faith Ringgold too. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Their story quilts. Right. Story yeah. Quilts, amazing. Yeah. Um, I know another, like, again, like, like fact that I just, I don't even know if they mentioned in the film or I did some Googling afterwards that um, Sheila de Brettville was in 1990, she was the first woman to receive tenure at the Yale, Uni at Yale School of Art. Excellent. I didn't like, know that. that was crazy. Like, like it was 1990. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Um, so that's not, you know, I guess it's long ago now. I'm like, that's like, I guess what? Well, you know, it's not that long ago. Not <laughs> that long ago, right? That's right. Okay. <laughs> not that long ago. I mean, it's, it's, yeah, right. Um, but that was, that was shocking to me. Because they kept talking about her being at Yale, so I googled it, but she was, yeah. yeah. Uh, but I think that, you know, there have been great strides in recognition for women artists. I think um, in the last few years, especially, um, like, <clears throat> excuse me, Howard Dina did get a national retrospective mm -hmm. exhibition last, within the last two years. 
um, which is long, over, long overdue. Yeah, yeah that's right. Uh, um, the, there have been a number of w exhibitions that really were kind of filling some of those overlooked, you know, some of those gaps in, in our view, like right. the Women of Abstract Expressionism. They did, you know, did a whole exhibition in Denver, did that, where they kind of, you know, all these women who were definitely part of that abstract expressionist movement, no question that they were part of that whole group, but had totally been kind of written out of that history. Um, so there's a whole, there, there is a lot, I think, of going back and kind of, you know, re-examining how so the, the history. The legacy of this feminist, like, art movement, where everything, you know, feminist yeah. art is sort of this, um, sort of, um, re-looking back at the canon and looking, reintegrating the canon, reintegrating museums, rediscovering artists who were quote unquote lost. To and, yeah, and, it, and it's not, and unfortunately, I think in a good way, it's not just women artists. It's all of the marginalized artists that started to, you know, some of the major museums are starting to kind of really open up as far as a lot of those artists that were on the outskirts or didn't fit into a category. You right. know, they weren't, they weren't working in a certain way, so they kind of got out of the, you know, right. That, right. That, if, you, if we can't compartmentalize them, then how do we present yeah, them? So right. let's and just move on. That's the, yeah. That's a lot of the problems with some of the people marginalized is they don't fit a category. Mm -hmm. So how do you include them, you know, in an exhibition or, or, or a, you know, a, if they're not part of a movement and that's the way we tend to teach art history is by movement. Right. Right. Where do you put them in your textbook either? Right. You know, right. If, they're, if, they're don't, if they don't fit anywhere. Yeah. Right? So mm -hmm. I think, I think there's a lot of re-examining going on about a lot of those kinds of people and those kinds of work, right. that kind of work. So I think it's positive. I think it's still yes, slow. I do. <laughs> right, right. Like I, think that's, I think it's important to note that it's like that sort of, I feel, I feel like that's like the positive legacy of the feminist art movement, that perhaps there's not this move, people aren't, you know, there's not, uh, you know, there's Judy Chicago, well, Judy Chicago is still making work, but, um, you know, that this, it's, it's this uh, kind of introspection that is the, the legacy. Right, like a constant taking of stock, right? Yeah, exactly, um, right. Like not taking anything for granted, like, wait, why are we doing this? Who are we yeah. looking at? We're asking Who's the right looking? questions. And, and no one's, no, and maybe there are no answers, but it lo as long as we're as asking the questions, then that's... Yeah, I think, I, I agree, to now. Yeah. yeah. That's very, very cool, Lisa. The, the, yeah, Soul of the Nation was, I, I, yeah. didn't, I, I didn't see that, but that sounded like an amazing exhibition. Oh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Rosa Bonheur, we agree. Yeah, very cool. Very, very cool. Oh, I love Rosa Bonheur, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. She's great. Okay. Um, so, <clears throat> anybody has any other questions? They can um, feel free to, um, we have upcoming um, events. Uh, we have a, I should just, I should have just wrote an event and I didn't realize yeah, that. Okay. I didn't know why. <laughs> um, we have one that has a date, so, uh, but uh, Saturday, May 9th, um, I think it's at 1130? Yes. Okay. Uh, so it's Artful Adventures, which is our family program. So if you're interested in doing some art projects with your family or not with your family because you can't see them, um, you can join on Instagram Live. So you have to follow us. I should have included our Instagram handle. I think it's at Hofstra. Yes. Hofstra U Museum of Art, I think. Yes. Yeah. Um, um, and so that's, so that's our next virtual event. But um, thanks, everybody, for coming. And thank you, especially Susan, for yeah, Thank you, Susan, up. so much for your thank insight and you being a part of this. Yeah, I'm, so I'm happy to, to be included anytime. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> And thank you for the show. I think it's wonderful. I love, you know, I, I, I just want to plug the show a little bit. I know, you know, it's not up and we can't go physically look at it, but just take it. I encourage everyone, if they haven't already, to take a look at it because I, I like how, um, I like small shows too. You know, we're so mm -hmm. used to like thinking about these blockbusters and, you know, we go to the Whitney and we see the big Warhol show and all of, and the Richter show, you know, at, uh, that's, that I'm dying to see it at, at, at uh, the Met right now. But I like a small show. I like something that's digestible and it's, you can think about it and it doesn't have to like have some like heavy handed theme that beats you over the head but it just kind of gently takes you through 
um, through time, really, because you, mm-hmm. so I, I really appreciate the show, Kristen. It's I think it's really lovely. Yeah. It's really yeah. well done, and it's it's um it's a nice size. I, I'm really I, I can't wait to see it in person. So I'm me really too. We can't either. Yeah, it's really well we, done. We were literally getting ready to hang it up that week that we went uh, remote. Yeah, no, I was yeah. intending to bring my contemporary class to it when yeah. we did. Yeah. It's, it's all framed. Like, it's just all been up. Literally. You know. The labels are ready, apart, to ready to go. <laughs> but some of them are right now, so they're getting that as they're getting some uh, uh, view of it here. So great, excellent. Okay. So thank you, everybody, for joining us. Mm-hmm.